In 1977, Apple, a young, fledgling company on the West Coast, invents the Apple II, the first personal computer as we know it today. IBM dismisses the personal computer as too small to do serious computing and unimportant to their business. I feel incredibly lucky to be at exactly the right place in Silicon Valley, at exactly the right time historically where this invention has, has taken form. It wasn't like we both thought it was going to go a long way. It was like we'll both do it for fun, and even though we're going to lose some money probably, we'll just have been able to say we had a company. All of us would get together and just hope we were right that the PC would become a big thing. You know, I stop and say, wow, the PC really has become part of the very fabric of the way people live. And we certainly surged with it. And I just stop and say, hmm, pretty incredible ride. We didn't even obey a 24-hour clock. We'd come in and program for a couple days straight. Uh, we'd, uh, you know, four or five of us, when it was time to eat, we'd all get in our cars and kind of race over to the restaurant and sit and talk about what we were doing. Sometimes I'd get excited talking about things I'd forget to eat, but then you know, we'd just go back and program some more. It was us and our friends. I'd sit down in my room on the floor with sheets of paper spread all around with my computer design I was working on, and always I noticed that I was up pretty late at night and I had lots of Cokes, just part of, it's part of that life. And I took this book home that described the PDP-8 computer, and it just, oh, it was just like uh, a Bible to me. I mean, all these things that, for some reason, I'd fallen in love with. Like, you might fall in love with um, a card game called Magic, or you might fall in love with doing crossword puzzles or something else, or playing a musical instrument. I fell in love with these little descriptions of computers on their inside. It was a little mathematics. I could work out some problems on paper and solve it and see how it's done, and I could come up with my own solutions and feel good in, inside. So you would keyboard these commands in, and then you would wait for a while, and then the thing would go, ta -ta 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 and it would tell you something out. But even with that, it was still remarkable, especially for a 10-year-old, that you could write a program in BASIC, let's say, or Fortran, and actually this machine would sort of take your idea and it would, tr it would sort of execute your idea and give you back some results. And if they were the results that you predicted, your program really worked, it was an incredibly thrilling experience. In a business like this, uh, the people with the power are the ones that have the understanding of what's going on, not necessarily the ones on top. It's very important that those people that have the knowledge uh, are the ones that make the decisions. So uh, we set up something where everyone who had the knowledge had an equal say in what was going on. If you look at it, you know, it was kind of a grandiose, uh, almost megalomaniac uh, kind of scheme, you know. Uh, and right now, I couldn't do it because I could see right off there's no way you could do this. There isn't any way you could do this. But at that time, you know, we just lacked the, uh, the benefits of age and experience. We didn't know we couldn't do it. Uh, then, okay, here was a company that would be needing software. We realized that things were starting to happen. And just because we'd had a vision for a long time of where this chip could go, what it could mean, uh, that didn't mean the industry was going to wait for us while... I stayed and, and finished my degree at Harvard. So we created this basic interpreter. Paul took the paper tape uh, and, and flew out. In fact, the night before, he, he got some sleep while I double-checked everything to make sure that we had, uh, had it all right. We hired uh, some, some of our uh, high school friends basically to come down and uh, uh, stay with us in our apartment, which became very crowded. Well, we were pretty young. We started when I was 19 and so he just had a lot of a lot of energy. They worked really hard. They uh, listened to really loud music. I could hardly stand to go in the software room sometimes because the music would be banging off the walls, mostly acid rock. But, you know, we'd usually go out, eat, eat pizzas and then go out and watch uh, action movies. Uh, <laughs> they would work all night long. And there were days when Bill Gates would be sleeping on the floor in the software uh, lab. And sometimes would be Bill and these two other guys all, you know, sitting on tables around the apartment uh, with, with stacks and stacks of paper, right, <laughs> converting the basic for the 8080. I still know the source code by heart, and that was a, uh, a work of, of love. You know, we just kept tuning and tuning that thing. And, and so that kind of craftsmanship 
paid off. We created an industry, and I think that goes completely unnoticed. I mean, there was nothing. Every aspect of the industry, when you talk about software, hardware, application stuff, dealerships, you, you name it, was all done at this. It was a wild time. It was a very exciting time. And the, the first user convention where we got people to come in and tell us what they were doing, what they were excited about, and other companies like Processor Technology or MSI or Comemco got going as add-on companies. These companies are long forgotten, but they were the, the humble beginnings of the, of the PC industry. Remember that the 60s happened in the early 70s, right? So we have to remember that. And that's sort of when I came of age. So I saw a lot of this. And to me, the spark of that was that there was something beyond sort of what you see every day. Far from the smell of the gun. It's the same thing that causes people to want to be poets instead of bankers. And I think that's a wonderful thing. And I think that that same spirit can be put into products. And those products can be manufactured and given to people and they can sense that spirit. Everybody was interested in computers, so I started getting a crowd around me because even though I was too shy to raise my hand and say anything in a club meeting, after the club meetings, I would put my, my computer that I had built, and every week it had a little bit more working on it, too. But I would set it down and let people type on the keyboard. I would explain what's in it. If they come up to me and ask a question, I can answer. Um, you know, nowadays, I would have the ability to tell them what it is, you know, and be a little bit more promotional. But back then, I could only answer questions that they asked me. But I got a group that started gathering around me. And Steve Jobs saw that I had a lot of interest around me at the club, and he said, let's start selling it. And uh, let's make this company. Came up with the name Apple, and, uh, and uh, that's how it started. It was very clear to me that while there were a bunch of hardware hobbyists that could assemble their own computers or at least take our board and add the transformers for the power supply and the case and the keyboard and go get, a, you know, et cetera, go get the rest of the stuff, for every one of those, there were a thousand people that couldn't do that but wanted to mess around with programming, software hobbyists, just like I had been when I was, you know, 10, discovering that computer. And so my dream for the Apple II was to sell the first real packaged computer. And then I got into a way of why have memory for your TV screen and memory for your computer make them one. And that shrunk the chips down, and I shrunk the chips here, and why not take all these timing circuits. I looked through manuals and found a chip that did it in one chip instead of five and reduced that. And one thing after another after another happened. I wound up with so few chips. When I was done, I said, hey, a computer that you could program to generate colored patterns on a screen or data or words or play games or anything. And it was just the computer I wanted, you know, for myself pretty much. And, uh, but it had turned out so good. He said, I think we have a computer we could sell a thousand a month of. How can you sell a thousand a month, you know? But we needed some money for tooling the case and things like that. We needed, we needed a few hundred thousand dollars. That was a lot of money for two people who had nothing in their lives to speak of, didn't have a $400 bank account. So I went looking for some venture capital. Well, he uh, wore sandals and he uh, had long, very long hair and uh, beard and mustache, but very articulate. He uh, was... I think he, at one time in his life, and it was probably when I first met him, that he ate nothing but fruit. So as a mainline venture capitalist, is this... Is this, is this, this is not the norm. <laughs> this is not the norm. My recollection is we stole the show. And a lot of dealers and distributors started lying. How old were you? 21. 21? Yeah. There would be public demonstrations of our product every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon at 3 o'clock. And that was good because it was after school. So I would get out of my, you know, sophomore, junior year of high school. I would ride my little moped down to the Apple offices, and at 3 o'clock I'd give the demonstrations of the Apple II. When we were in the office, it was, hey, jokes and wiring up people's phones to do weird things, just every one of us. I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't a person in Apple, I don't think, for a couple of years that was, you know, super serious. We were lucky. We had, like, the hot product of its day. It went so successful that all of a sudden, Steve and I wouldn't have to worry about work for the rest of our lives. And then it got even more successful and more successful after that. And uh, it was sort of, sort of a shock.
everybody you talked to just seemed excited about talking about what we were doing. And uh, there was this huge media explosion, kind of like the Internet is receiving today, of this is the happening thing. You read about it over and over and over, and every time you took an airplane flight, you read about it. And every newspaper every week, you'd read something about small computers coming, and Apple was one of the highlight companies. So we were being portrayed as a leader of a revolution, and we really felt that we were a leader of a revolution. We were going to change life a lot. I was worth um, about over a million dollars when I was 23, and over ten million dollars when I was twenty-four and over a hundred million dollars when I was twenty-five um, and it's, it wasn't that important uh, because I never did it for the money it was just a little hobby company like a lot of people do not thinking anything of it I mean it wasn't it wasn't like we both thought it was gonna go a long ways it was like we'll both do it for fun but back then there was a short window in time where one person who could sit down and do some neat good designs could turn them into a huge thing like the Apple II. We are nerds. Most of the people in the industry were young because the guys who had any real experience were too smart to get involved in all these crazy little machines. It really wasn't that we were going to build billion dollar businesses. We were having a good time. I thought this was the most fun you could possibly have with your clothes on. One time was funny. I, I went to, um, to Bill's house and he really wanted to show me his, his jigsaw puzzle that he was working on. And he really wanted to talk about how like he did this jigsaw puzzle in like four minutes. And like on the box it says if you're a genius then you would do the jigsaw puzzle in like seven. And um, he was into it. He's like, you know, I can do it. And I said, no, you know, I believe you. You don't need to break it up and do it for me. No. <laughs> Bill Gates can be so focused that the small things in life get overlooked. If he was busy, he didn't bathe. He didn't change clothes. We were in New York, and the demo that we had crashed the evening before the uh, announcement, and Bill worked all night with some other engineers to fix it. Well, it didn't occur to him to take 10 minutes for a shower after that just didn't occur to him that that was important and he badly needed a shower that day <laughs> at about uh, oh about noon I guess I called Bill Gates uh, on Monday and said I would like to come out and talk with him about uh, his products Bill said well how's next week and they said we're on an airplane we're leaving in an hour we'd like to be there tomorrow well hallelujah right on and Bill said, Steve, you better come to the meeting. You're the only other guy here who can wear a suit. So we figured, okay, the two of us will put on suits, we'll put on suits, and we'll go to this, this meeting. We got there roughly 2 o'clock. And uh, we were waiting in the front, and uh, this young fellow came out to, to take us back to Mr. Gates' office. I thought he was the office boy. And, it, of course, it was Bill. He was quite decisive. We, uh, we popped out the non-disclosure agreement, the letter that said that he wouldn't tell anybody we were there and that we wouldn't hear any secrets and so forth. He signed it immediately. Now, IBM didn't make it easy. You had to sign all these funny agreements that sort of said I, IBM could do whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted, and use your secrets however they, they felt. But So it took a little bit of faith. They thought we had an operating system. Because we had this soft card product that had CPM on it, they thought we could license some CPM for this new personal computer they told us they wanted to do. And we said, well, no, we're, we're not in that business. And when we discovered we didn't have the, he, he didn't have the rights to do that and that it was not, he said, but I think it's ready. I think Dick Gary's got it ready to go. <clears throat> I said, well, no, but no time like the present, call up Gary. So Bill, right there with them in the room, called Gary Kildall, Digital Research, said, Gary, I'm sending some guys down. They're going to be on the phone. Treat them right. They're important guys. And Gary was, had some other plans, and so he said, well, uh, Darth, you'll see you. And uh, so we went down, the three of us. IBM showed up with an IBM non-disclosure, and, and Dorothy made what I, what, a decision which I think it's easy in retrospect to say was dumb. Well, we popped out our letter that said, uh, uh, please don't tell anybody we're here and we don't want to hear anything confidential and uh, she read it and she said I can't sign this. She did what her job was, she got the lawyer to look at the non-disclosure, the lawyer uh, Jerry Davis who's still in Monterey uh, threw up on this uh, 
non-disclosure. It was uncomfortable for IBM. They weren't used to being waiting, and, and, and it was an unfortunate situation. Here you are in a tiny Victorian house that's overrun with people and chaotic. And so we spent the whole day in Pacific Grove debating with them and with our attorneys and her attorneys and everybody else about whether or not she could um, even talk to us about talking to us. And we left. Digital research didn't seize that, and we knew it was essential. If somebody didn't do it, the project was going to fall apart. So we just got carried away and said, look, we can't afford to lose the language business. That was the initial thought. We can't afford to have IBM not go forward. This is the most exciting thing that's going to happen in PCs. And we were already out on the limb because we had licensed them not only basic, but Fortran, COBOL, Assembler, uh, Typing Tutor, Adventure. And basically every, every product the company had we had committed to do for IBM in a very short time frame. There's a local company here in, in, uh, in Seattle called Seattle Computer Products, a guy named Tim Patterson, and he had done an operating system, very rudimentary operating system that was kind of like CPM. And we just told IBM, look, we'll go get this operating system from the small local company, we'll take care of it, we'll fix it up, and you can still do a PC. So I took a CPM manual that I'd gotten from the retail computer store, $5 in 1976 or something, and uh, used that as the basis for uh, the, what the, what we, the application programming interface, the API for my operating system. And so uh, using these, these ideas that uh, came from different places, I started in April, and it was about half time for four months I, uh, before I had my, my first working version. But then we went back and said to them, look, you know, we want to buy this thing. And SCP was, like most little companies, they, you know, always needed cash. And so that was when they went into the negotiation. And uh, so ended up working out a deal to, uh, uh, to buy the operating system uh, from him for, for, for whatever usage we, you know, we wanted for $50,000. The key to our, the structure of our deal was that IBM had no control of our, over our licensing to other people. And the lesson of the computer industry in mainframes was that uh, over time people built compatible machines or clones, whatever term you want to use. And so really the primary upside on the deal we have with IBM, because they had a fixed fee, uh, we got about $80,000 and we got some other money for some special work we did, uh, but no royalty from them and that's the DOS in basic as well and so we were hoping a lot of other people would come along and do compatible machines what IBM said was it's okay corporate America for you to now start buying and using PCs and if it's okay for corporate America it's got to be okay for everybody euphoric I guess is the right word everybody was uh, believed that, that that they were not going at that point uh, Two million or three million, you know, they were now thinking in terms of 100 million. I mean, they were probably off the scale in the other direction. Things get less expensive every year. People aren't used to that in general. I mean, you buy a new car, you buy one now, like four years later, go buy one, it costs more than the one you bought before. Here, this magical piece of an industry, you go buy one later, it costs less. And it does more. What a wonderful thing. But it causes some funny things to occur when you think about an industry. An industry where prices are coming down, where you have to sell it and use it right now because if you wait later, it's worth less. And so a lot of, of young, I, I say people, but mostly it was young men who just were out of school, saw him as this incredible uh, role model or, or uh, leader, almost a guru, I guess. And they could sit and spend hours with him and, and uh, he valued their contributions and and there was just a wonderful camaraderie that seemed to exist between all these young men and Bill. And the strength that he has and, this, and his will and his desire to be the best and to be the winner. And he is just a, like a cult leader, really. It was just part of, as we used to call it at the time, riding the bear. You just had to try to stay on the bear's back, and the bear would twist and turn and try to fuck you and throw you, but darn, we were going to ride the bear because the bear was the biggest, the most important. You just had to be with the bear. Otherwise, you would be under the bear uh, in the computer industry, and IBM was the bear, and we were going to ride the back of the bear. But it's easy for people to forget how pervasive IBM's influence over this industry was. When you talk to people who've come into the industry recently, there's no way 
you can get that into their into their head. That was the environment. In IBM, there's a religion in software that says you have to count k locks, and a k lock is a thousand line of code. How big a project is it? Oh, it's a 10 k lock project. This is a 20 k locker, and uh, there's a 50 k locks. And IBM wanted to sort of make it the religion about how we we got paid, how much money we made off OS2, how much they did, how many k locks did you do? And we kept trying to convince them, hey, if we have a developer's got a good idea and he can get something done in 4k locks instead of 20k locks should we make less money because he's made something smaller and faster less clocks oh k locks k locks that's the methodology yeah anyway it almost makes my my back just crinkle up at the thought of the whole thing when i took over in 89 there was an enormous amount of resources working on os2 both in Microsoft and the IBM company. Bill Gates and I met on that several times. And we pretty quickly came to the conclusion together that that was not going to be a success the way it was being managed. Uh, it was also pretty clear that the negotiations and the contracts had given most of that control to Microsoft's. We created Windows in parallel. I, we kept saying to IBM, hey, Windows is the way to go, graphics is the way to go. Uh, and we got virtually everyone else enthused about Windows. So that was a, a divergence that we kept thinking we could get IBM to, to come around on. It was clear that IBM had a different vision of its relationship with Microsoft than Microsoft had of its vision with IBM. Is that Microsoft's fault? You know, maybe some. But IBM's not blameless there either. So I, I, don't, I don't view any of that as anything but just uh, poor business on IBM's part. We said, ooh, IBM's probably not going to like this. This is going to threaten OS2. Now, we told them about it. Right away, we told them about it. But we still did it. They didn't like it. We told them about it. We told them about it. We offered to license it to them. We always thought the best thing to do is, is to try and combine IBM promoting the software with us uh, doing the engineering and so it was only when they broke off communication and um, decided to go their own way that we thought okay we're, we're on our own and and that was definitely very very scary and we were in a major negotiation in early 1990 right before the Windows launch we wanted to have IBM on stage with us to launch Windows 3.0 but they wouldn't do the kind of deal that would allow us to profit it would allow them essentially to take over Windows from us and we walked away from the deal. Then they, uh, at that point, I think they agreed to disagree on the future progress of, uh, of OS2 and Windows. And internally, we were told, thou shalt not ship any more products on Windows. Um, and about that time, I got the opportunity to uh, take early retirement, so I did. Uh, basically, give a third of their market value to Intel and a third of their market value to Microsoft by accident. I mean, no one, you know, no one. I mean, those two companies today are worth uh, close to, you know, approaching a hundred billion dollars. I mean, not many of us get a chance to make a hundred billion dollar mistake. Bill wanted to win. Incredible desire to win and to beat other people. At Microsoft, we, the whole idea was that we would put people under, you know, and unfortunately. Uh, that's happened a lot. <laughs> Bill Gates is special. It, you wouldn't have had a Microsoft with take a random other person like Gary Kildall. On the other hand, Bill Gates was also lucky. But Bill Gates knows that, unlike a lot of other people in the industry, and he's paranoid. Every morning he gets up and he doesn't feel secure, he feels nervous about this. They're trying hard. They're not relaxing, and that's why they're so successful. And um, I remember I was talking to Bill once, and I, I, um, I asked him what he feared. And um, he said that he feared growing old because, you know, once you're beyond 30, this, is, this was his belief at the time, you know, once you're beyond 30, you know, you're, you don't have as, as many good ideas anymore. It's like you're not as smart anymore. If you just slow down a little bit, uh, who knows who it'll be? Probably some company that may not even exist yet. But... Uh, you know, someone else can come in and, and take the lead. I said, well, you know, you're going to age. It's going to happen. It's kind of inevitable. Well, what are you going to do about it? 
And he said, I'm just going to hire the smartest people, and I'm just going to surround myself with all these smart people, you know. And I thought that was kind of interesting. It was, it was almost, it was like he was like, oh, you know, I can't be immortal, but like maybe this is the second best, and I can buy that, you know. <laughs> if you miss what's happening, then the same kind of thing that that happened to IBM or many other companies could happen to Microsoft very easily. So no one's got a guaranteed position in the high technology business. And the more you think about, you know, how could we move faster? What could we do better? Are there good ideas out there that? Uh, we should be going beyond. Uh, it's it's important, and I wouldn't trade places with anyone. But uh, the reason I like my job so much is we have to constantly uh, stay stay on top of those things. You could take uh, computer technology into the office and make the office a much better place to work, more productive, uh, more enjoyable, a lot more enjoyable. Um, more interesting, more rewarding, uh, and so we set to work on it. There was total intellectual freedom. There was no conventional wisdom. Uh, almost every idea was up for challenge and got challenged regularly. The management said, go create the new world. We don't understand it. Here are people who have a lot of ideas and tremendous talent, young, energetic. People came there specifically to work on five-year programs that were their dreams. Everybody wanted to make a real difference. We really thought we were changing the world and that at the end of this uh, project or the set of projects, personal computing would burst on the scene exactly the way we had envisioned it and take everybody by total surprise. And none of the main body of the company was prepared to accept the answers. So there was a tremendous mismatch between the management and what the researchers were doing in that these guys had never fantasized about what the future of the office was going to be and when it was presented to them, they had no mechanisms for turning those ideas into real life products. And, and that, was, that was really the frustra frustrating part of it because you were talking to people who didn't understand the vision. And yet the vision was getting created every day within the, the Palo Alto Research Center, and there was no one to receive that vision. When I wasn't sure what the word charisma meant, I met Steve Jobs, and then I knew. Steve Jobs is on my eternal heroes list. There's nothing he can ever do to get off it. He wanted you to be great. And he wanted you to create something that was great and he was going to make you do that. He's also uh, uh, obnoxious, and uh, this comes from his high standards. He has extremely high standards, and he has no patience with people who don't either share those standards or perform to them. And I'm also one of these people that I, I don't really care about being right, you know. I just care about success. And they showed me really uh, three things. But I was so blinded by the first one that I didn't even really see the other two. Uh, one of the things they showed me was object-oriented programming. They showed me that, but I didn't even see that. The other one they showed me was really a networked computer system. They had over 100 Alto computers, all networked, using email, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't even see that. I was so blinded by the first thing they showed me, which was the graphical user interface. I thought it was the best thing I had ever seen in my life. Now, remember, it was very flawed. What we saw was incomplete. They'd done a bunch of things wrong, but we didn't know that at the time. It's still, though, they had the germ of the, of the idea was there, and they'd done it very well. And within, you know, 10 minutes, it was obvious to me that all computers would work like this. So he came back and I almost said ask, but the truth is demanded that his entire programming team get a demo of the Smalltalk system. And the then head of the Science Center asked me to give the demo because Steve specifically asked for me to give the demo. And I said, no way. I had a big argument with the Xerox executives telling them that they were about to give away the kitchen sink. And um, I said I would only do it if I were ordered to do it. 
because then it, of course, would be their responsibility. And that's what they did. I think mostly what we got in that hour and a half uh, was inspiration. And basically just sort of a, a bolstering of our convictions that um, the, a, a more graphical way to do things um, would make the, this business computer more accessible. After an hour looking at demos, they understood our technology and what it meant more than any Xerox executive understood it after years of showing it to them. Basically, they were copier heads that just had no clue about uh, a computer or what it could do. And so they, they just grabbed, uh, grabbed defeat from the greatest victory in the computer industry. Xerox could have owned the entire computer industry today. Um, could have been, you know, a company ten times its size. Could have been IBM. Could have been the IBM of the 90s. Could have been the Microsoft of the 90s. You know, I, I brooded for a few months. But it, it, was, it was not very long after that that it really occurred to me that if we didn't do something here, the Apple II was running out of gas. And we needed to do something with this technology fast or else Apple might cease to exist as the company that it was. And so I formed a small team to do the Macintosh. And, you know, we... We were on a mission from God, you know, to save Apple. And then he looked up at me and just stared at me with this stare that only Steve Jobs has. And he said, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to come with me and change the world? And I just gulped because I knew I would wonder for the rest of my life, you know, what I would have missed. Steve was upset that the Mac took too long to boot. To boot up when you first turned it on. So he tried motivating Larry Kenyon by telling him, well, you know, you know how many millions of people are going to buy this machine? There's going to be millions of people. And let's, let's imagine that you can make it boot five seconds faster. Well, that's five seconds times a million every day. That's 50 light lifetimes. You're, you, if you can shave five seconds off that, you're, you're saving, saving 50 lives. Uh, and so, you know, it was a nice way of thinking about it. <laughs> and we did get it to go faster. Jobs talked to Bill at some industry conference and said, hey, we're doing, I think Lisa was sort of in development. He said, but I'm going to do the graphical interface machine here at Apple. Not just that Lisa thing, Bill. I'm going to do the one, the one that's really going to be the, the winner. When, when was your first date with Macintosh? We've been working with the Mac uh, for almost two years now. And we put some of our, our really good people on it. And uh, even before we finished our work on the IBM PC, uh, Steve Jobs came and talked about what he wanted to do, that he thought he could do sort of a Lisa but cheaper. We said, boy, we'd love to help out. The Lisa had all its own applications, but of course they required a lot of memory, uh, and we thought we could do better. And so Steve signed a deal with us. Uh, to actually provide bundled applications for the first Mac. And so we were big believers in the Mac Apple's and what, red, what Steve was doing there. IBM's blue, if the Most Mac's people don't remember, but until the Mac, Microsoft was not in the applications business. It was dominated by Lotus. And Microsoft took a big gamble to write for the Mac. And so uh, we got started in, in early 1982 on our Macintosh uh, software effort. And I think at that point in time, you know, it really clicked with Bill that, you know, graphic user interface was going to be the way, the way of the future. But while Bill was having his own GUI revelation, Jobs believed that Apple's true enemy was IBM. Will Big Blue dominate the entire computer industry? The entire information age? Was George Orwell right about 1984? And most pundits considered that uh, Apple was going to be out of business. You know, in a few short months, Business Week ran an article on their cover saying, um, it's over, IBM has won. In the case of the Macintosh team, um, they were behind schedule in getting the Mac out, which is not unusual in high technology. Um, and so just getting that product to market was extremely important. No design issue was too small, and it was never too late to do it right. Oh, it was a pressure cooker. We were working until, until we finished. We couldn't go to sleep or anything. I was up for three days before in, in that very last push. And uh, finally, just the stars aligned, and the last release we made at 6 a.m. that morning. I remember uh, how nervous Steve was uh, before the introduction of the Macintosh. And 
the rehearsal the night before was a total disaster. Um, nothing seemed to go right. Steve was upset at everybody. Uh, we wondered how in the world we were ever going to get through the introduction the following day. But when that moment came, uh, Steve was a master showman. There have only been two milestone products in our industry. The Apple II in 1977 and the IBM PC in 1981. Today, one year after Lisa, we are introducing the third industry milestone product, Macintosh. Many of us have been working on Macintosh for over two years now, and it has turned out insanely great. You've just seen some pictures of Macintosh. Now I'd like to show you Macintosh in person. It comes down to trying to expose yourself to the best things that humans have done and then try to bring those things in to what you're doing. I mean, Picasso had a saying, he said, good artists copy, great artists steal. And we have, you know, always been shameless about stealing great ideas. Um, and I think part of what made the Macintosh great was that the people working on it were musicians and poets and artists and zoologists and historians who also happened to be the best computer scientists in the world. It didn't do very much. We had Mac Paint and Mac Write uh, were our, our only applications. And the market started to figure this out. Um, by the end of the year, people said, well, maybe the uh, IBM PC isn't as easy to use or is not as attractive as the Macintosh, but it actually does something which we want to be able to do, spreadsheets, word processing, and database. And so we started to see the sales of the Mac tail off towards the end of 1984, um, and, and that became a problem the following year. Within two or three weeks, uh, we had canceled our internal project. A bunch of people wanted to kill me over this, but we did it. And uh, I had cut a deal with Adobe to use their software, and we bought 19.9% .9 of Adobe at Apple. The grandiose plans of what Macintosh were going to be was just so far out of whack with the truth of what the product was doing. And the truth of what the product was doing was not horrible. It was salvageable. But the gap between the two was just so unthinkable that somebody had to do something, and that somebody was John Scully. The, the board had to make a, a choice, and I said, look, it's Steve's company. Uh, I was brought in here to help. You know, uh, If you want him to run it, that's fine with me. Um, but you know, we've got to at least decide what we're going to do, and everyone's got to get behind it. But he took it as a personal attack, uh, started attacking Scully, uh, in which create, you know, backed himself into a corner because uh, he was sure that the board would support him and not Scully. And um, ultimately, after the board talked with Steve and talked with me, um, the decision was that we would um, go forward with um, my plans, and Steve left. Um. What can I say? I hired the wrong guy. That was Scully? Yeah. And uh, he destroyed everything I'd spent 10 years working for, um, starting with me. But that wasn't the saddest part. Uh, I would have gladly left Apple if Apple would have turned out like I'd wanted it to. People in the company had very mixed feelings about it. Everyone had been terrorized by Steve Jobs at some point or another, and so there was a certain relief that the terrorist would be gone. And on the other hand, I think there was incredible respect for Steve Jobs by the very same people. And we were all very worried what would happen to this company without the visionary, without the founder, without the, char without the charisma. Apple never recovered from losing Steve. Steve was the heart and soul and driving force. It would be quite a different place today. Uh, they lost their, uh, their soul. February or March of 1984, which was just right after the Apple Macintosh, had been introduced. And at that point in time, it was we were firmly convinced that we needed to bet on graphic user interface. 
and I was the development manager for Windows 1.0, and you know we kept slogging and slogging, and yeah, it took us I don't know about seven versions, but it took us a few versions to get things right before 1990. That's right. The look and feel, which is how it looks, the experience of using it was not patentable, but it was copyrightable. But there was no precedent law. This was going to be a precedent-setting case. But it was a period of five years where you know, Microsoft, uh, our whole strategy, would have been ruined uh, because Windows was very important to us. They weren't going to change anything. And um, they were going to get us to cave in or take us all the way to the Supreme Court on this thing. We assumed that the lawyers, the judges, would all come to the right conclusion, which, which eventually they did. And Apple lost. But uh, in that period of about uh, six years that this case was going on, uh, it may have lulled us into a bit of complacency, thinking that uh, we were going to be insulated you know, from the Windows attack. You know, the original PC uh, did our evangelism and the way we created tools for that you know, pull that together. Uh, take Windows. Did we bet our company on that? Did that come together? Virtually everything we've done when we first come out with it, there's a lot of skepticism. But most of the things, we, we really stuck with them, and despite all that um, second guessing, we're able to pull them off. The problem was the industry wasn't measured by who has the best selling personal computer you know, or who has the most innovative technology. The industry was measured by uh, who had the most open system that was adopted by the most other companies. And the Microsoft strategy ultimately turned out to be the better business strategy. The only problem with Microsoft is they just have no taste. They have absolutely no taste. And, and, and what that means is, I don't mean that in a small way, I mean that in a big way, in the sense that they they don't think of original ideas and they don't bring much culture into their product um, and, and you say well wh why is that important well you know proportionally spaced fonts come from typesetting and beautiful books that's where one gets the idea if it weren't for the Mac they would never have that in their products um, and so I, I guess I am saddened not by Microsoft's success I have no problem with their success they've earned their success for the most part. I have a problem with the fact that they just make really third-rate products. I will admit, quite frankly, that I think Windows today is probably four years behind, three years behind, where it would have been had we not danced with IBM for so long. Because the amount of split energy, split work, split IQ in the company really cost our end customer real innovation in our product line and so whenever I hear these criticisms which I gotta say sting uh, sometimes I say to myself just you watch just you watch Windows 95 Windows 9 we're, there's no lack of focus there hasn't been here for the last three four years since we didn't have this big split with IBM and I think even in the operating systems area now you'll start to see clear clear and people will recognize clear leadership you know, we, we just keep making them better. We get millions of phone calls. We get to go out there and talk to customers. And there's nothing cast in concrete. If, if people decide there's something that we should change, we, we change it. It's a lot better than, than most industries in that sense. I think the way that applications user interfaces have advanced over the last decade, Microsoft is, has been at the forefront of a very high percentage of that. And you know, I think it's, it's great stuff. You know, if you take the way the internet is changing month by month, if somebody can predict what's going to happen three months from now, nine months from now, even today, uh, my hat's off to them. I think we've got a phenomena here that is moving so rapidly that nobody knows exactly where it will go. We shouldn't spend all of our time wringing our hands about you know Microsoft, you know Microsoft world domination. That uh, there's still room left for innovation. There's there's going to be change, and Microsoft's future is not assured. I hate the PC with a passion. Me, me going down to the store and buying Windows 95, gotta get in my car, drive down to drive down to a store, buy a bo cardboard box full of bits, you know, you know, encoded on a piece of plastic, a CD-ROM, bring it home, read a manual, and install this thing. You must be kidding. You know, 
put the stuff on the net. It's bits. Don't put bits in cardboard. Cardboard in trucks. Trucks to stores. Me, you know, me go to the store. You know, pick this stuff out. It's insane. Okay, I love the internet. I want information. You know, it come, it flows across the wire. I mean, if you talk to people that use the Macintosh, they love it. I mean, you don't hear people loving thing products very often. You know, really. But but you could feel it in there. There was something really wonderful there. On January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. There was no conventional wisdom. Uh, almost every idea was up for challenge and got challenged regularly. The management said, go create the new world. We don't understand it. Here are people who have a lot of ideas and tremendous talent, young, energetic. People came there specifically to work on five-year programs that were their dreams. Everybody wanted to make a real difference. We really thought we were changing the world and that at the end of this uh, project or the set of projects, personal computing would burst on the scene exactly the way we had envisioned it and take everybody by total surprise. And none of the main body of the company was prepared to accept the answers. So there was a tremendous mismatch between the management and what the researchers were doing in that these guys had never fantasized about what the future of the office was going to be and when it was presented to them, they had no mechanisms for turning those ideas into real life products. And, and that, was, that was really the frustra frustrating part of it because you were talking to people who didn't understand the vision. And yet the vision was getting created every day within the, the Palo Alto Research Center, and there was no one to receive that vision. When I wasn't sure what the word charisma meant, I met Steve Jobs, and then I knew. Steve Jobs is on my eternal heroes list. There's nothing he can ever do to get off it. He wanted you to be great. And he wanted you to create something that was great and he was going to make you do that. He's also uh, uh, obnoxious, and uh, this comes from his high standards. He has extremely high standards, and he has no patience with people who don't either share those standards or perform to them. And I'm also one of these people that I, I don't really care about being right, you know. I just care about success. And they showed me really uh, three things. But I was so blinded by the first one that I didn't even really see the other two. Uh, one of the things they showed me was object-oriented programming. They showed me that, but I didn't even see that. The other one they showed me was really a networked computer system. They had over 100 Alto computers, all networked, using email, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't even see that. I was so blinded by the first thing they showed me, which was the graphical user interface. I thought it was the best thing I had ever seen in my life. Now, remember, it was very flawed. What we saw was incomplete. They'd done a bunch of things wrong, but we didn't know that at the time. It's still, though, they had the germ of the, of the idea was there, and they'd done it very well. The next week, and they said, we're on an airplane. We're leaving in an hour. We'd like to be there tomorrow. Well, hallelujah, right on. And Bill said, Steve, you better come to the meeting. You're the only other guy here who can wear a suit. So we figured, okay, the two of us will put on suits, we'll put on suits, and we'll go to this, this meeting. We got there roughly 2 o'clock. And uh, we were waiting in the front, and uh, this young fellow came out to, to take us back to Mr. Gates' office. I thought he was the office boy. And, it, of course, it was Bill. He was quite decisive. We, uh, we popped out the non-disclosure agreement, the letter that said that he wouldn't tell anybody we were there and that we wouldn't hear any secrets and so forth. He signed it immediately. Now, IBM didn't make it easy. You had to sign all these funny agreements that sort of said I, IBM could do whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted, and use your secrets however they, they felt. But So it took a little bit of faith 
They thought we had an operating system. Because we had this soft card product that had CPM on it, they thought we could license some CPM for this new personal computer they told us they wanted to do. And we said, well, no, we're, we're not in that business. And when we discovered we didn't have the he didn't have the rights to do that and that it was not he said but i think it's ready i think Dick gary's got it ready to go <clears throat> i said well no but no time like the present call up gary so bill right there with them in the room called gary killed all digital research said gary i'm sending some guys down they're going to be on the phone treat them right they're important guys and gary was had some other plans and so he said well uh, darth you'll see you and uh, so we went down the three of us IBM showed up with an IBM non-disclosure, and, and Dorothy made what I, what, a decision which I think it's easy in retrospect to say was dumb. Well, we popped out our letter that said, uh, uh, please don't tell anybody we're here, and we don't want to hear anything confidential. And uh, she read it, and she said, I can't sign this. She did what her job was. She got the lawyer to look at the non-disclosure. The lawyer, uh, Jerry Davis, who's still in Monterey, uh, threw up on this uh, non-disclosure it was uncomfortable for IBM they weren't used to being waiting and 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 it was an unfortunate situation here you are in a tiny Victorian house that's overrun with people and chaotic and so we spent the whole day in Pacific Grove debating with them and with our attorneys and her attorneys and everybody else about whether or not she could um, even talk to us about talking to us and we left Digital research didn't seize that, and we knew it was essential. If somebody didn't do it, the project was going to fall apart. So we just got carried away and said, look, we can't afford to lose the language business. That was the initial thought. We can't afford to have IBM not go forward. This is the most exciting thing that's going to happen in PCs. And we were already out on the limb because we had licensed them not only BASIC, but Fortran, COBOL, Assembler, uh, Typing Tutor, Adventure. And basically every every product that comes a tremendous mismatch between the management and what the researchers were doing in that these guys had never fantasized about what the future of the office was going to be and when it was presented to them they had no mechanisms for turning those ideas into real life products and, and that was that was really the frustrating frustrating part of it because you were talking to people who didn't understand the vision and yet the vision was getting created every day within the, the Palo Alto Research Center, and there was no one to receive that vision. When I wasn't sure what the word charisma meant, I met Steve Jobs, and then I knew. Steve Jobs is on my eternal heroes list. There's nothing he can ever do to get off it. He wanted you to be great. And he wanted you to create something that was great. And he was going to make you do that. He's also uh, uh, obnoxious. And uh, this comes from his high standards. He has extremely high standards, and he has no patience with people who don't either share those standards or perform to them. And I'm also one of these people that I, I don't really care about being right, you know. I just care about success. And they showed me really uh, three things. But I was so blinded by the first one that I didn't even really see the other two. Uh, one of the things they showed me was object-oriented programming. They showed me that, but I didn't even see that. The other one they showed me was really a networked computer system. They had over 100 Alto computers, all networked, using email, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't even see that. I was so blinded by the first thing they showed me, which was the graphical user interface. I thought it was the best thing I had ever seen in my life. Now, remember, it was very flawed. What we saw was incomplete. They'd done a bunch of things wrong, but we didn't know that at the time. It's still, though, they had the germ of the, of the idea was there, and they'd done it very well. And within, you know, 10 minutes, it was obvious to me that all computers would work like this. So. He came back. And I almost said ask, but the truth is demanded that his entire programming team get a demo of the Smalltalk system. And the then head of the Science Center asked me to give the demo because Steve specifically asked for me to give the demo. And I said, no way. I had a big argument with the Xerox executives telling them that they were about to give away the kitchen sink. And um, 
I said I would only do it if I were ordered to do it, because then, of course, would be their responsibility. And that's what they did. The greatest victory in the computer industry. Xerox could have owned the entire computer industry today. Um, could have been, you know, a company ten times its size. Could have been IBM. Could have been the IBM of the 90s. Could have been the Microsoft of the 90s. You know, I, I brooded for a few months. But it, it, was, it was not very long after that that it really occurred to me that if we didn't do something here, the Apple II was running out of gas. And we needed to do something with this technology fast or else Apple might cease to exist as the company that it was. And so I formed a small team to do the Macintosh. And, you know, we... We were on a mission from God, you know, to save Apple. And then he looked up at me and just stared at me with this stare that only Steve Jobs has. And he said, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to come with me and change the world? And I just gulped because I knew I would wonder for the rest of my life, you know, what I would have missed. Steve was upset that the Mac took too long to boot to boot up when you first turned it on. So he tried motivating Larry Kenyon by telling him, well, you know, you know how many millions of people are going to buy this machine? There's going to be millions of people. And let's, let's imagine that you can make it boot five seconds faster. Well, that's five seconds times a million every day. That's 50 light lifetimes. You're, you, if you can shave five seconds off that, you're, you're saving, saving 50 lives. Uh, and so, you know, it was a nice way of thinking about it. <laughs> and we did get it to go faster. Jobs talked to Bill at some industry conference and said, hey, we're doing, I think Lisa was sort of in development. He said, but I'm going to do the graphical interface machine here at Apple. Not just that Lisa thing, Bill. I'm going to do the one, the one that's really going to be the, the winner. When, when was your first date with Macintosh? We've been working with the Mac uh, for almost two years now, and we put some of our, our really good people on it. And uh, even before we finished our work on the IBM PC, uh, Steve Jobs came and talked about what he wanted to do, that he thought he could do sort of a Lisa but cheaper. We said, boy, we'd love to help out. The Lisa had all its own applications, but of course they required a lot of memory, uh, and we thought we could do better. And so Steve signed a deal with us. Uh, to actually provide bundled applications for the first Mac. And so we were big believers in the Mac Apples and what, red, what Steve was doing there. IBM's blue. If the Most people don't remember, but until the Mac, Microsoft was not in the applications business. It was dominated by Lotus. And Microsoft took a big gamble to write for the Mac. And so uh, we got started in, in early 1982 on our Macintosh uh, software effort. And I think at that point in time, you know, it really clicked with Bill that, you know, graphic user interface was going to be the way development manager for Windows 1.0. And, you know, we kept slogging and slogging. And, yeah, it took us, I don't know, about seven versions, but it took us a few versions to get things right before 1990. That's right. The look and feel, which is how it looks, the experience of using it, was not patentable, but it was copyrightable. But there was no precedent law. This was going to be a precedent-setting case. But it was a period of five years where, you know, Microsoft, uh, our whole strategy would have been ruined uh, because Windows was very important to us. They weren't going to change anything. And um, they were going to get us to cave in or take us all the way to the Supreme Court on this thing. We assumed that the lawyers, the judges would all come to the right conclusion, which, which eventually they did and Apple lost, but uh, in that period of about uh, six years that this case was going on, uh, it may have lulled us into a bit of complacency, thinking that uh, we were going to be insulated, you know, from the Windows attack. You know, the original PC uh, did our evangelism and the way we created tools for that you know, pull that together. Uh, take Windows. Did we bet our company on that? Did that come together? Virtually everything we've done when we first come out with it, there's a lot of skepticism. But most of the things, we, we really stuck with them, and despite all that um, second guessing, we're able to pull them off. The problem was the industry wasn't measured by who has the best selling personal computer you know, or who has the most innovative technology. The industry was measured by uh, who had the most open system that was adopted by the most other companies. 
and the Microsoft strategy ultimately turned out to be the better business strategy. The only problem with Microsoft is they just have no taste. They have absolutely no taste, and, and, and what that means is, I don't mean that in a small way, I mean that in a big way, in the sense that they, they don't think of original ideas, and they don't bring much culture into their product. Um, and, and you say, well, wh why is that important? Well, you know, proportionally spaced fonts come from typesetting and beautiful books. That's where one gets the idea. If it weren't for the Mac, they would never have that in their products. Um, and so I, I guess I am saddened, not by Microsoft's success. I have no problem with their success. They've earned their success for the most part. I have a problem with the fact that they just make really third-rate products. I will admit, quite frankly, that I think Windows today is probably four years behind, three years behind, where it would have been. Reduce that, and one thing after another after another happened. I wound up with so few chips. When I was done, I said, hey, a computer that you could program to generate colored patterns on a screen, or data, or words, or play games, or anything. And it was just the computer I wanted, you know, for myself, pretty much. And, uh, but it had turned out so good. He said, I think we have a computer we could sell a thousand a month of. How can you sell a thousand a month, you know? But we needed some money for tooling the case and things like that. We needed, we needed a few hundred thousand dollars. That was a lot of money for two people who had nothing in their lives to speak of, didn't have a $400 bank account. So I went looking for some venture capital. Well, he uh, wore sandals and he uh, had long, very long hair and uh, beard and mustache, but very articulate. He uh, was... I think he, at one time in his life, and it was probably when I first met him, that he ate nothing but fruit. So as a mainline venture capitalist, is this... Is this, is this, this is not the norm. This is not the norm. My recollection is we stole the show. And a lot of dealers and distributors started lying. How old were you? 21. 21? Yeah. There would be public demonstrations of our product every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon at 3 o'clock. And that was good because it was after school. So I would get out of my, you know, sophomore, junior year of high school. I would ride my little moped down to the Apple offices, and at 3 o'clock I'd give the demonstrations of the Apple II. When we were in the office, it was, hey, jokes and wiring up people's phones to do weird things. Just every one of us. I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't a person in Apple, I don't think, for a couple of years that was, you know, super serious. We were lucky. We had, like, the hot product of its day. It went so successful that all of a sudden, Steve and I wouldn't have to worry about work for the rest of our lives. And then it got even more successful and more successful after that. And uh, it was sort of, sort of a shock. Everybody you talked to just seemed excited about talking about what we were doing. And uh, there was this huge media explosion, kind of like the Internet is receiving today, of this is the happening thing. You read about it over and over and over, and every time you took an airplane flight, you read about it. And every newspaper, every week, you'd read something about small computers coming. And Apple was one of the highlight companies. So we were being portrayed as a leader of a revolution. And we really felt that we were a leader of a revolution. We were going to change life a lot. I was worth... Um about over a million dollars when I was 23 and over 10 million dollars when I was 24 and over a hundred million dollars when I was 25 um, and sir um, you know nowadays I would have the ability to tell them what it is you know and be a little bit more promotional but back then I could only answer questions that they asked me but I got a group that started gathering around me and Steve Jobs saw that I had a lot of interest around me at the club and he said let's start selling it and uh, let's make this company, came up with the name Apple, and, uh, and uh, that's how it started. It was very clear to me that while there were a bunch of hardware hobbyists that could assemble their own computers or at least take our board and add the transformers for the power supply and the case and the keyboard and go get, a, you know, et cetera, go get the rest of the stuff, for every one of those, there were a thousand people that couldn't do that but wanted to mess around with programming, software hobbyists just like I had been when I was, you know, 10, discovering that computer. 
And so my dream for the Apple II was to sell the first real packaged computer. And then I got into a way of why have memory for your TV screen and memory for your computer make them one? And that shrunk the chips down, and I shrunk the chips here, and why not take all these timing circuits? I looked through manuals and found a chip that did it in one chip instead of five and reduced that. And one thing after another after another happened. I wound up with so few chips. When I was done, I said, hey, a computer that you could program to generate colored patterns on a screen or data or words or play games or anything. And it was just the computer I wanted, you know, for myself pretty much. And, uh, but it had turned out so good. He said, I think we have a computer we could sell a thousand a month of. I thought, how can you sell a thousand a month, you know? But we needed some money for tooling the case and things like that. We needed, we needed a few hundred thousand dollars. That was a lot of money for two people who had nothing in their lives to speak of, didn't have a $400 bank account. So I went looking for some venture capital. Well, he uh, wore sandals and he uh, had long, very long hair and uh, beard and mustache, but very articulate. He uh, was, I, th I think he, at one time in his life, and it was probably when I first met him, that he ate nothing but fruit. So as a mainline venture capitalist, is this... Is this, is this, this is not the norm. <laughs> this is not the norm. My recollection is we stole the show. And a lot of dealers and distributors started lying. How old were you? 21. 21? Yeah. There would be public demonstrations of our product every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon at 3 o'clock. And that was good because it was after school. So I would get out of my, you know, sophomore, junior year of high school. I would ride my little moped down to the Apple offices, and at 3 o'clock, I'd give the demonstrations of the Apple II. When we were in the office, it was, hey, jokes and wiring up people. Was, I, th I think he, at one time in his life, and it was probably when I first met him, that he ate nothing but fruit. So as a mainline venture capitalist, is this... Is this, is this, this is not the norm. <laughs> this is not the norm. My recollection is we stole the show. And a lot of dealers and distributors started lying. How old were you? 21. 21? Yeah. There would be public demonstrations of our product every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon at 3 o'clock. And that was good because it was after school. So I would get out of my, you know, sophomore, junior year of high school. I would ride my little moped down to the Apple offices, and at 3 o'clock, I'd give the demonstrations of the Apple II. When we were in the office, it was, hey, jokes and wiring up people's phones to do weird things. Just every one of us. I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't a person in Apple, I don't think, for a couple of years that was, you know, super serious. We were lucky. We had, like, the hot product of its day. It went so successful that all of a sudden, Steve and I wouldn't have to worry about work for the rest of our lives. And then it got even more successful and more successful after that. And uh, it was sort of, sort of a shock. Everybody you talked to just seemed excited about talking about what we were doing. And uh, there was this huge media explosion, kind of like the Internet is receiving today, of this is the happening thing. You read about it over and over and over. And every time you took an airplane flight, you read about it. And every newspaper every week, you'd read something about small computers coming. And Apple was one of the highlight companies. So we were being portrayed as a leader of a revolution and we really felt that we were a leader of a revolution we were going to change life a lot I was worth um, about over a million dollars when I was 23 and over 10 million dollars when I was 24 and over a hundred million dollars when I was 25 um, and it's it wasn't that important uh, because I never did it for the money it was just a little hobby company like a lot of people do, not thinking anything of it. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like we both thought it was going to go a long ways. It was like, we'll both do it for fun. But back then, there was a short window in time where one person who could sit down and do some neat, good designs could turn them into a huge thing like the Apple II.
We are nerds. Most of the people in the industry were young because the guys who had any real experience were too smart to get involved in all these crazy little machines. People came there specifically to work on five-year programs that were their dreams. Everybody wanted to make a real difference. We really thought we were changing the world and that at the end of this uh, project or the set of projects, personal computing would burst on the scene exactly the way we had envisioned it and take everybody by total surprise. And none of the main body of the company was prepared to accept the answers. So there was a tremendous mismatch between the management and what the researchers were doing in that these guys had never fantasized about what the future of the office was going to be and when it was presented to them they had no mechanisms for turning those ideas into real life products and, and that was that was really the frustrating frustrating part of it because you were talking to people who didn't understand the vision and yet the vision was getting created every day within the, the Palo Alto Research Center and there was no one to receive that vision when I wasn't sure what the word charisma meant I met Steve Jobs and then I knew Steve Jobs is on my eternal heroes list there's nothing he can ever do to get off it he wanted you to be great and he wanted you to create something that was great and he was going to make you do that. He's also uh, uh, obnoxious. And uh, this comes from his high standards. He has extremely high standards, and he has no patience with people who don't either share those standards or perform to them. And I'm also one of these people that I, I don't really care about being right, you know. I just care about success. And they showed me really uh, three things. But I was so blinded by the first one that I didn't even really see the other two. Uh, one of the things they showed me was object-oriented programming. They showed me that, but I didn't even see that. The other one they showed me was really a networked computer system. They had over 100 Alto computers, all networked, using email, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't even see that. I was so blinded by the first thing they showed me, which was the graphical user interface. I thought it was the best thing I had ever seen in my life. Now, remember, it was very flawed. What we saw was incomplete. They'd done a bunch of things wrong, but we didn't know that at the time. It's still, though, they had the germ of the, of the idea was there, and they'd done it very well. And within, you know, 10 minutes, it was obvious to me that all computers would work like this. So. He came back and I almost said ask, but the truth is demanded that his entire programs that were their dreams. Everybody wanted to make a real difference. We really thought we were changing the world and that at the end of this uh, project or the set of projects, personal computing would burst on the scene exactly the way we had envisioned it and take everybody by total surprise. And none of the main body of the company was prepared to accept the answers. So there was a tremendous mismatch between the management and what the researchers were doing in that these guys had never fantasized about what the future of the office was going to be and when it was presented to them they had no mechanisms for turning those ideas into real life products and, and that was that was really the frustrating frustrating part of it because you were talking to people who didn't understand the vision and yet the vision was getting created every day within the, the Palo Alto Research Center and there was no one to receive that vision. When I wasn't sure what the word charisma meant, I met Steve Jobs and then I knew. Steve Jobs is on my eternal heroes list. There's nothing he can ever do to get off it. He wanted you to be great. And he wanted you to create something that was great and he was going to make you do that. He's also uh, uh, obnoxious, and uh, this comes from his high standards. He has extremely high standards, and he has no patience with people who don't either share those standards or perform to them. And I'm also one of these people that I, I don't really care about being right, you know. I just care about 
success. And they showed me really uh, three things. But I was so blinded by the first one that I didn't even really see the other two. Uh, one of the things they showed me was object-oriented programming. They showed me that, but I didn't even see that. The other one they showed me was really a networked computer system. They had over 100 Alto computers, all networked, using email, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't even see that. I was so blinded by the first thing they showed me, which was the graphical user interface. I thought it was the best thing I had ever seen in my life. Now, remember, it was very flawed. What we saw was incomplete. They'd done a bunch of things wrong, but we didn't know that at the time. It's still, though, they had the germ of the, of the idea was there, and they'd done it very well. And within, you know, 10 minutes, it was obvious to me that all computers would work like this. So. He came back and, I almost said asked, but the truth is, demanded that his entire programming team get a demo of the Smalltalk system.